Hello and welcome. First and foremost, on behalf of the students of Westminster College, I would like to extend a warm welcome to Mr. Robinson. More than seven decades ago, Sir Winston Churchill gave a world-changing speech here on our campus, which heralded the start of the Cold War. During the 1990s, after many years of to toil, the global leaders most responsible for ending that ideological conflict visited Westminster. Margaret Thatcher, Mikhail Gorbachev, and of course, Ronald Reagan. The precedent was set. Westminster is an epicenter, not only for the history of the Cold War, but for transformative leaders and speakers to come here and to change the world. Today, we add another esteemed name to that list. Mr. Robinson's words help bring down that very symbol of the Cold War that sits here on our campus, the Berlin Wall. For almost 30 years, it served as a brutal and physical reminder of the division between the East and the West. In today's era of political and cultural divisions, we should all be comforted by the fact that in 1989, humanity did come together to tear down that most prominent of barriers. It serves as a reminder for the students who walk by it every day that whatever walls may come between us, we can always tear them down. For that reason, Mr. Robinson's words of hope are just as important today as they were 30 years ago. We, the students of Westminster, are excited to have you join us here today and are so grateful for the opportunity to hear your profound insight into the final chapter of the Cold War. Thank you for being here today. I have the um, great task of putting this occasion uh, in context. Uh, as President Lampkin said, and as Sarah so eloquently said, uh, Westminster College has been a place of great speeches. Um, first and foremost, perhaps, was the speech here on March 5th, 1946, uh, when Winston Churchill famously uh, made the phrase Iron Curtain a worldwide popular phrase. The Berlin Wall had not yet been built, uh, but it was a stern warning uh, to the West that Soviet aggression was looming. Of course, the Berlin Wall came to be um, and then came to pass. Um, Mr. Gorbachev and others did indeed tear down the wall. We rebuilt it uh, here at Westminster College. The monument uh, we saw outside moments ago, Breakthrough, uh, stands as now a symbol of freedom as opposed to a symbol of oppression. Here it is being erected on the college campus in 1990 by Churchill's granddaughter, sculptor Edwina Sands. President Reagan was here uh, in 1990 on the first anniversary of the fall of the wall to dedicate that sculpture. And not only did President Reagan come, but so did Mr. Gorbachev, who in fact spoke in front of the same wall behind the lectern from which Winston Churchill gave his Iron Curtain address here nearly 75 years ago. So I can think of no one better uh, this evening than Mr. Robinson, whose words uh, and whose relationship with President Reagan uh, were informed and inspired by all of these men, uh, and who is here today to share with us some of his insights and how his famous speech the one delivered by President Reagan um, came to pass. So without further ado, welcome to Westminster College, Peter Robinson. Thank you, President Lampkin, Sarah, Sarah Ayers, Tim Riley, Christopher Wren, <laughs> those introductions were so kind that uh, there's really no place to go but down. <laughs> I had a particular job on the, in the Reagan White House. I was the well man. A speech would be written 
it would get marked up by the chief speech writer, then it would go to the president, he would make his final edits, and then the speech would come back to me. And I would look it over very carefully, and here and there I would insert, well, <laughs> a relief that that got a laugh. I, I, that, that has started to, when I tell that to students, they just look at me, force me to explain the joke. Th now I know I'm among friends and my own generation. I should also say, I, I, as, uh, as President Lampkin and Tim mentioned, I also worked for Vice President, as he was then, George H.W. Bush. And there was a, a moment when speechwriter, my predecessor actually, inserted a quotation from Thucydides. And George H.W. Bush got to this passage and said, in the words of Thucydides, as, th as Plato once said. <laughs> First, a word about the wall itself. Two thirds of you will know all of this already, but about a third of you are students. And so I have learned in recent years that it's important to begin a discussion of the speech with a discussion of the wall. And that begins with post-war Germany. So Tyler, if I may have the first slide. After the Second World War, Germany was divided into two sectors. The red sector there indicates the territory that came under the Red Army. The Soviets invaded that portion. And that became East Germany under a communist regime that the Soviets installed. The large blue section, West Germany, which was under the administration of Americans, British, and French. And in the middle, and this is important, Sarah and other students, this is very important to grasp. Berlin, the city of Berlin, was deep inside East Germany. And like Germany itself, Berlin was divided into East, the communist sector, and West, that little blue bit, surrounded by red, West Berlin. Almost immediately after the Second World War, the differences between the communist East Germany and the democratic and free market West Germany began to become clear. And East Germans responded to that by leaving for West Germany. Uh, in 1952, the East German regime sealed the border between the two countries, but not the border in Berlin itself, because that blue bit surrounded by red, remained under the administration of American, British, and French military forces. But, so at this point, from 1952 on, East Germans who wanted to leave for West Berlin had only one place to do so, Berlin itself. They would go to East Berlin, and there they could get on a subway and take the subway to West Berlin, or they could simply walk across through various checkpoints from East Berlin to West Berlin. Once they were in West Berlin, they could get on a train, and there were carefully negotiated provisions so that trains could pass across East Germany. They could simply get on a train and go to the West. By 1960, the number of East Germans who had left for the West came to about three and a half million. And that was one in five East Germans. That was 20% of the population. The East German regime worked with Moscow, they had to come up with some solution to what they viewed as a problem. They were losing people. And their solution was the Berlin Wall. On the night, Sunday, I beg your pardon, Saturday night, August 12th, 1961, East German police began to surround West Berlin with barbed wire. By the following day, a Sunday, they had completely surrounded West Berlin. Second slide, please. That day, Yes, that shows the barbed wire. That day is still known in Germany. I won't attempt the German word for it. Um, that's, that day is still known in Germany as barbed wire Sunday. In subsequent days, they replaced the barbed wire with cinder blocks. Next slide, please. And then over the following weeks and months, they replaced the cinder blocks with concrete slabs, some of which are just outside. We just lay a wreath in front of those, of, of some of those slabs. Four meters about 13 feet tall. So it was a, it, the Berlin Wall became quite quickly a real wall. And what you can see there, that is about the way, I think the slide number, yes, that's, that's 
Slide number five, have you got that, Tyler? There we go. That's the way the wall looked in the 1980s. Graffiti on the western side, where there was freedom, and on the eastern side, and this is important to bear in mind, on the eastern side, there's a, there's a large no man's land. That was a killing zone. And you could prove it by trying to escape across it. They'd shoot you. So that's the background. That's what the Berlin Wall was, and that's where it was, and that's why they built it in the first place. That brings us to the spring of April, that brings us to April 1987. Berlin was celebrating its 750th anniversary. Queen Elizabeth had already visited. Mikhail Gorbachev intended to visit. And the West German government, Chancellor Helmut Kohl, got in touch with the White House. Since Gorbachev was going to visit, he requested a visit to Berlin from President Reagan to offset Gorbachev, to demonstrate the continued American commitment to Berlin. I was given the assignment, and here's what I was told by the senior staff. Here's where the president's going to stand. He'll have a, an audience of 10 to 40,000 in front of him, and uh, he'll speak for 30 minutes, and he ought to talk about foreign policy. Full stop, that's the guidance. So I went to Berlin with the American pre-advance party. The pre-advance party made up of security people who would talk to their West German counterparts, some press officials who would look for the proper camera angles, make sure that they could see where there, were going, there was going to be enough electricity for television cameras and so forth, and one speechwriter. Four events in Berlin for me that day. The first was the visit to the place where the president would speak. Berlin Wall here, the Reichstag, the old German parliament, off to the left. Uh, there had been a fire, as you'll recall, in 1933. Hitler blamed it on communists, used that as an excuse to pass a, the so-called enabling law that permitted him to rule Germany by decree from that day until the day he killed himself, more than a dozen years later. And I mounted the observation platform, just a set of wooden steps to a platform. You could look over the Berlin Wall. And this is, it's very hard, Sarah and other students, it's very hard to convey what it felt like. But it's important to try. If you look over the wall into East Berlin, the communist East, you're looking down a thoroughfare called Unter den Linden, under the linden trees or under the lime trees, which was the main ceremonial avenue in Berlin. It was like our Pennsylvania Avenue or the Champs-Élysées in Paris. And yet it was as though the color had just been leached out of the picture. Gray, brown, very few pedestrians, the soldiers marching right here, off in the distance a few pedestrians, the buildings seemed in bad, ill repair. Then if you turned West Berlin, color, activity, recent model cars, I could hardly believe how many Mercedes Benzes there were. Of course it was Germany. <laughs> uh, so this, and, and it was almost as though the air felt heavy. You had such a sense of history. This wall was where it was because this was how far the Red Army got when it moved into Berlin. And now that was communism and this was democracy and you could just swivel and see the difference between the two. So my impression was I was in real trouble. What could I give to Ronald Reagan that would in any way equal that sense of felt history on that spot? Second, I then went to the uh, office of the ranking American diplomat in Berlin, a man called John Kornblum, who later became our ambassador to a reunited Germany. And John Kornblum was full of ideas, but they were all ideas about what Ronald Reagan should not say. This is a, we're in, deep in the middle of communist territory. Everybody here understands the nuance and subtlety necessary in East-West relations. Don't have him sound like an anti-communist cowboy no Soviet bashing, and don't make a big deal about the wall. They've gotten used to it by now. <laughs> so I was in worse trouble. Third event, I was given a ride in a US Army helicopter over the wall. 
We flew very close to the border, but stayed inside Western territory. And whereas from inside West Berlin, the wall looked formidable enough, you could forget about it for a moment or two because it was a modern, bustling city, and then you'd turn a corner, and at the end of the street, there was a wall. And it turned, that, that, was, that was hard to take. It was oppressive in some way. But from the air, you could look onto the other side of the wall and see that no man's land. Nope, that, 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 that. there. See, uh, for a moment, my life flashed before my eyes. <laughs> and so that barbed wire, guard towers, dog runs, also there were large areas of very carefully raked gravel. And I couldn't, that I couldn't figure out. So I used the walkie-talkie to ask the pilot, what, what was the point of the gravel? And he explained that the gravel was there for the sake of those young East German soldiers. If any one of those young men got the idea that he'd let a member of his family escape in the middle of the night, he would know that he would have to explain the footprints in the gravel to his superior officer. So I just thought, those bastards, forgive me, in a church, but <laughs> they had thought of everything. Fourth and final event. I broke away from the American party. We were staying at a hotel in downtown West Berlin. I got in a cab and went out to a leafy suburb, residential suburb of West Berlin, where a couple of Berliners had agreed to put on a small dinner party for me, simply so that I could meet some Berliners. I had met no one in the room, including the host and hostess, a man called Dieter Elz and his wife Ingeborg Elz. But the Elzes and I had friends in common in Washington. The friend had said, Robinson is going to be there. Could you put something on for him? So there were about 15 West Berliners there, different ages, different walks of life. There was a physician, a professor, a couple of students. My friend Dieter Elz had retired from the World Bank in Washington back to he was German, back to Germany. He and his wife had just retired. This is how we had friends in common. They'd spent time in Washington. And we chatted for a bit about German weather, which even they admitted was bad, and German wine, which they claimed was very good. And then I just, I thought, well, this is going nowhere, but I, I have a question I have to ask, so I asked it. I explained that I had been told by the ranking American diplomat in Berlin, in West Berlin, that the president shouldn't mention the wall because they'd all gotten used to it. And I said, and I, I had just flown over the wall. Is it true? Have you gotten used to that? Silence. And I thought I had committed just the gaffe that the diplomat wanted to make sure the president avoided. And then one man raised his arm and pointed. And he said, my sister lives just a few kilometers in that direction, but I haven't seen her in more than 20 years. How do you think we feel about this wall? And they went around the room, and each person talked about the wall. They had stopped talking about it after all these years. But if you ask them, they would let you know they had not gotten used to it. One man described walking to work each morning from his home to his office. He followed the same route each day. And he said, I pass a guard tower. There's a young man up there with a rifle over his shoulder who looks down at me with binoculars. We share the same history, we speak the same language, but one of us is a zookeeper and the other is an animal, and I have never been able to decide which was which. And our hostess, Ingeborg Elz, who was a lovely woman, she'd been charming, kept the dinner party, the conversation moving along, but she became angry. And she said, she made, a, she made a fist of one hand, and she said, if this man Gorbachev is serious with this talk, this glasnost, this perestroika, he can prove it by coming here and getting rid of that wall. That went into my notes. I felt, next slide please, Tyler. You, you, I doubt you can see it from here, but that's a picture of a one page in the notebook that I kept in Berlin. Item 17 there. If, what does it say? If the Russians, if the Russians want, are willing to open up, then the wall must go. And I just felt the moment she made that remark that if President Reagan had been there in my place, he would have responded to that, to the power, to the decency, to the truthfulness of that remark. So I 
that was a, the happy ending of, a, of an otherwise very difficult day. I thought, I've got something. I've got something here. Back to the White House, and I drafted a speech around the call to tear down the wall. I took a week to write the first draft. It was no good at all. Rested up over the weekend, came back, and took another stab at it. I will say, I would like to be able to say that the inspiration just flowed. But for me, if not for most people, writing is hard work, and I made a lot of mistakes in that draft. At one point, <clears throat> I thought to myself, this is a tricky problem. The audience on television, the television audience will be back home, they'll be American, but I've got to give him some lines for the German audience. He'll have 10 to 40,000 Germans listening. So I put the, the critical line in German in one draft. Instead of tear down this wall, Herr Gorbachev, machen Sie dieser Tor auf. And my boss, Tony Dolan, looked at that and said, Peter, when your client is the President of the United States, give him his big lines in English. <laughs> but eventually, I produced a draft. And now, <laughs> I have to, I, I don't know whether I should tell this part to the students because it may fill them with slightly subversive ideas, but, I, but the story is what it is. Uh, we speechwriters pulled something of a fast one. It was standard in the Reagan White House. The rules differ from one, one White House to another, but it was standard in the Reagan White House that before a speech went to the president, it went out to staffing. So it would be circulated to interested cabinet parties. A foreign policy speech would go to the Pentagon. It would go to the State Department. It would get, go to the National Security Council. There would be a dozen people who would see a speech and mark it up and let you know how stupid those speechwriters were. And then you'd have to incorporate these changes and mollify people. And then it went to the president. But in the speechwriting office, we knew, we suspected, we sensed that calling to tear down the wall might raise a few hackles with the staff. So uh, my boss, Tony Dolan, came up with a plan. Before the president was going to go to Berlin, he was going to Italy for an economic summit in Venice. He was going to go to Rome, he'd meet the Pope, he'd meet the president of Italy, then he'd go to Venice, there was an economics, so there were quite a few speeches involved. The big one was going to be in Berlin, but there were, there were other sets of remarks. So everybody on the speech writing staff, there were six of us at the time, Everybody hurried up to get these smaller remarks done. And on a Friday afternoon in May, Tony Dolan, my boss, waited until he heard the whoop, whoop, whoop of the helicopter landing on the South Lawn to take the president to Camp David. And then he took all of these speeches over to the West Wing and gave them to the staff secretary, the man who handled the president's paperwork, who was proof that God exists. I, that, I can, that I can say in a church, who was new to his job and not quite clear on, on how procedures should be followed. And Tony Dolan said, you know, the president, there's a, quite a load of speeches for the president to mark up. You'd better give them to him right now so he can get a head start with them and look them over at Camp David. And the staff secretary went for it. <laughs> and so when the whoop, whoop, whoop of the helicopter taking off, the Berlin Wall speech was with the president, and nobody had seen it but us speechwriters. And Ronald Reagan was who looked at it that weekend. The following Monday, May 18th, 1987, I can remember that very well, speechwriters had a meeting with the president in the Oval Office, and we went through speech by speech. There was one, one I remember uh, my colleague Josh Gilder had drafted remarks for the president when he met Pope John Paul II. And the president, president had looked at those, but he wanted to, he, he dictated in the way, that Ronald Reagan, you never call it dictation, you would just start talking and we would all scramble to take notes. And he started, he gave a beautiful passage about the importance of religious freedom and how uh, religious stirrings in Eastern Europe he thought were very significant. And Josh Gilder wrote all this wonderful material down. By the way, you may not be surprised to learn this. Josh added that material to his draft, and then his draft went out to staffing, and the State Department objected. 
to the president's material. So Josh said, by the way, may I just ask, why are you objecting? And the answer is, well, no, it's, it's too religious. And my friend Josh said, what, what, the, he's talking to the Pope. <laughs> and, and the State Department official said, well, no, no, yeah, but he's talking to the Pope in the Pope's capacity as a head of state, not as a religious leader. And, and Josh, Josh said, well, would it make any difference if I told you that the precise paragraphs that you have drawn, through which you have drawn an X came from the president's own lips? And the State Department official said, well, in that case, I withdraw the objection with reservations. <laughs> All right. We had this meeting in the Oval Office and got to my speech. And the president just said, well, uh, that was a good draft. That's a, that's a fine speech. Well, I always wanted more from Ronald Reagan. So we'd go into these meetings, and you'd, you'd think through a question or two if you had a chance to ask them if there was enough time that might elicit more from the president. So I had a question ready, and I asked it. I said, Mr. President, when I was in Berlin, I learned that they'll be able to hear your speech in the east, on the communist side of the wall. And if the weather conditions are just right, they may be able to pick it up by radio all the way to Moscow. Is there anything in particular you'd like to say to the people on the communist side of the wall? And the, the president <clears throat> thought for a moment, and then he said, I can still, this, this plays like a film in my mind. And then he said, well, that's, yes. Do you see that astonishingly young and handsome looking man with a red and blue tie? That's, uh, that's what I used to be. The president, the president said, well, there's that, um, there's that passage about tearing down the wall. That's what I want to say to them. That wall has to come down. And I walked out feeling disappointed because I hadn't gotten anything new from the president. But that just shows what a fool I was. The next thing that happened was that the speech went out to staffing. And from that moment until the president delivered the speech three weeks later, the State Department and the National Security Council fought it. They said it would raise false expectations, it sounded unpresidential, that it would put Gorbachev in a difficult position by addressing Gorbachev personally. And they submitted, by my journal, in my journal I noted that they submitted seven alternative drafts, each on a different pretext, but from each the call to tear down the wall was missing. And the, the director of communications who was in on this with Tony Dolan and me and us speechwriters, a fellow called Tommy Griscom. He'd get a draft from the State Department or the NSC and he'd have me come over to his office and read it and then argue about whether I ought to submit, we ought to use that draft or the one that I had written. And one time when he had me come over, Colin Powell, the students won't remember him, you can Google him, Colin Powell, who was the number two man at the National Security Council, was there waiting for me. And Powell started shouting at me, and, and I was 30 years old. Being a speechwriter was the first full-time job I had ever had. I was that much of a loser. <laughs> and Colin Powell was already a very decorated and distinguished military man. And do you know what I did? I screamed and shouted right back at him. I don't know which one of us was more surprised. <laughs> But what was going on was that everybody in the organization had heard what happened in that meeting. Ronald Reagan wanted to deliver that passage. And what that meant was that the pressure point was the speechwriting office. If they had gotten me to back down, I could have written a memorandum to the president saying, dear, dear Mr. President, on, on more mature reflection, this passage is probably not the right, and then I could have substituted different material, and the president probably would have deferred to the writer who'd done the research and drafted the remarks. But I refused to do so. So the fighting went on and on and on. And I was not part of the traveling party, but the president and the traveling party left for Italy. And now I have to tell you what I heard from people who were telephoning me, letting me know what was happening. <clears throat> 
the State Department and the National Security Council kept it up. And in fact, the Secretary of State, George Shultz, objected. The, the Deputy Chief of Staff, a man called Ken Duberstein, and Ken, Ken is the one who told me how this finally happened. The Chief of Staff, Howard Baker, did not go on the trip because his wife was very ill at that moment. So the ranking White House official was a man called Ken Duberstein. And he decided that he had to take this, the whole matter back to the President for a second decision. The fighting just didn't die down. The objections didn't die down. So Ken told me that he sat the President down in the garden of some Italian palazzo where they were staying, and he went through the objections to this particular passage, sounds unpresidential, will raise false expectations, so forth. And then he had the President reread the central passage, and they talked about it for a little while. And then Ken said there came a moment when Ronald Reagan got that Ronald Reagan twinkle in his eye. And he said, now, Ken, I'm the president, aren't I? <laughs> yes, sir, we're clear about that much. So I get to decide if that line stays in? Yes, sir, it is your decision. Well, then, it stays in. I should show you, could we have slide number eight? I just want to get to show you some of these objections. This is a photo, this is one page of the national security uh, one of the many markups. That X at the bottom, that's Mr. Gorbachev tear down this wall. Out! And the next slide, please. This is a memorandum from National Security Council staff to Colin Powell. The Brandenburg Gate speech is better than before. We made a few changes to compromise. But the staff is still unanimous, unanimous that it's a mediocre speech and a missed opportunity, close quote. I don't want to suggest that I'm the kind of person who holds grudges <laughs> for 30 years. <laughs> but there are other words that come to mind that I should not use in a church. On the morning the president, this is now June 12th, 1987. On the morning the president was to fly in Air Force One from Venice to Berlin to deliver the speech, the fax machine on Air Force One, the fax machines, that's another thing the students will have to Google, fax machines, started to clack and the State Department was sub submitting yet another alternative draft. And the president was nothing doing. Ken Duberstein told me that in the limousine, on the way to deliver the speech, the president explained that he was going to de deliver the draft as written. And then he leaned across and slapped Ken Duberstein on the knee. And he said, the boys at State are going to kill me for this, but it's the right thing to do. That was Ronald Reagan. I think in a moment we'll, we'll hear the speech. Is that correct, Tim? All right. So here's the postscript. November 9th, 1989, 30 years ago this coming Saturday, the East German Politburo is meeting an emergency session. Why is that? Because protests had begun the previous month in October, Monday, regular Monday protests, but the protests began as prayer meetings at churches in Leipzig, at a church, one church in Leipzig, quickly spread to other churches, and then quickly spread throughout East Germany. And by November, the protests were massive, and the re regime decided to permit a protest to take place down Unter den Linden, that main thoroughfare that I told you about, and to the regime's horror, the, the whole alley was jammed. Nobody knows the number, but it was somewhere between 100 and 200,000 people protesting against the communist regime. November 9th, they're in an emergency session, and they pass a decree. they're passing a number of decree decrees. They're trying to mollify the protesters, trying to brazen it out the way they had in the past. And one of the decrees Turns out it, it was quite complicated. They wanted to change the rules that might make it somewhat easier for people who wanted to leave East Germany for West Germany. But one man, a member of the Politburo, a faithful Communist Party hack, called Gunter Schabowski. In the afternoon of November 9th, he's holding a press conference and he's trying to explain these new decrees that are being passed. And he gets this latest decree. He hasn't been briefed on it. He isn't quite sure what it means. And he creates the impression during the press conference 
that it means that all border controls are going to be lifted. And someone says, wait, of course, they can hardly believe their ears. And someone, a member of the press says, what, effective when? And Shabowski says, as far as I understand, effective immediately. This gets replayed throughout East Berlin. Largely, they were listening to West Berlin radio and television that was broadcast into East Berlin. And by that evening, East Berliners are lining up at the half dozen checkpoints in the Berlin Wall. The soldiers have no idea what's happening. They frantically telephone their superiors. The superiors don't know what's happening. And no one is willing to take responsibility for issuing fresh orders. Finally, one guard one, at the, one of these checkpoints opens the gate. And the others very quickly follow suit. And by the following morning, as you know the scenes, by the following morning, tens of thousands of East Berliners are in West Berlin, and the Berlin Wall has fallen, ceased to take effect. It wasn't Gorbachev who tore it down. It was Gorbachev who chose to keep the Red Army in the barracks this time. I might close with one little postscript. Um, I had an opportunity to talk to Gorbachev with Mike Reagan at one point, this is some years ago, and asked the question, 1953, East Germans, there's an East, Germans, East German workers uprising, East Berlin workers uprising, and the Soviets crush it. 1956, Hungarian Revolution, the Soviets crush it. 1968, the Prague Spring, and the Soviets crush it. This, all three times, the Red Army tanks had rolled through the streets. And then comes 1989, and you, Mr. Gorbachev, choose to keep the troops in their barracks. No tanks roll. Why? And Gorbachev said an astonishing thing, through his interpreter, obviously. He said, well, you must understand that President Reagan and I shared the same Christian ethics. And he could see us reeling. He said, no, 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 I'm a good communist. Of course I'm a communist. But we shared the same ethics. And then he told the story about growing up his grandfather was the big communist in town. And when the communists would come to the home for meetings, his grandfather would put up a picture of Lenin and a picture of Stalin. And then when the communists left, his grandmother, who was a believer, would take down Stalin and take down Lenin and put up icons of St. Andrew, Andrew and St. Michael. And Gorbachev, said, and Gorbachev remained close to her all his life. He said she would come stay with him in Moscow, and she would say, she would leave in the middle of the day and say, I'm going off to church to pray for you atheists. <laughs> and he said, of course, I'm a communist, I'm a communist, but still, we have the same outlook. And that, to me, was the ultimate, the final failure of the, of the communist system. They failed to create the new Soviet man. There you had in Gorbachev, the last leader of the Soviet Union, he called himself a communist, but his fundamental outlook was still formed by old Russia, by the Judeo-Christian tradition. He still had what, what we would all recognize as a sense of decency, which is how it all was able to end in peace. Thank you. Tim says, now comes the time when we're going to sh show the speech. And I, want, I have two apologies to make. The first is that, can you, I'm shocked at how badly dressed I am. I have a suit. I bought new shoes, pretty expensive new shoes to wear here. And United Airlines, those communists, United <laughs> Airlines, <laughs> United Airlines has my suit and my shoes in O'Hare. So that's my first apology. The second apology is, I believe, do you want, are you going to show the whole speech? OK. So after the call to tear down the wall, there's a boring bit. <laughs>
and the boring bit lasts two or three minutes. And I say, I, I'm apologizing to you. Actually, I'm not really apologizing. I'm, I'm blaming the State Department because the boring bit is a passage that we decided, we speechwriters decided to insert to get the good bit past them. <laughs> but when you feel bored, after the call to tear down the wall, there's this boring passage, and then the speech gets interesting again. Of course, the interesting bit is the part I wrote. <laughs> but the boring bit, just imagine if the whole speech had been that boring and you will have a good idea of what the State Department and the National Security Council wanted him to do. Thank you. Standing before the Brandenburg Gate, 
every man is a German separated from his fellow men. Every man is a Berliner forced to look upon a scar. President von Weizsäcker has said that the German question is open as long as the Brandenburg Gate is closed. But today, today I say as long as this gate is closed, as long as this scar of a wall is permitted to stand, it is not the German question alone that remains open, but the question of freedom for all mankind. <laughs> Yet, I do not come here to lament, for I find in Berlin a message of hope, even in the shadow of this wall, a message of triumph. In this season of spring in 1945, the people of Berlin emerged from their air raid shelters to find devastation. Thousands of miles away, the people of the United States reached out to help. And in 1947, Secretary of State, as you've been told, George Marshall, announced the creation of what would become known as the Marshall Plan. Speaking precisely 40 years ago this month, he said, our policy is directed not against any country or doctrine, but against hunger, poverty, desperation, and chaos. In the Reichstag a few moments ago, I saw a display commemorating this 40th anniversary of the Marshall Plan. I was struck by a sign, a sign on a burnout gutted structure that was being rebuilt. I understand that Berliners of my own generation can remember seeing signs like it dotted throughout the western sectors of the city. The sign read simply, the Marshall Plan is helping here to strengthen the free world. A strong free world in the West that dream became real. Japan rose from ruin to become an economic giant. Italy, France, Belgium, virtually every nation in Western Europe saw political and economic rebirth. The European community was founded. In West Germany and here in Berlin, there took place an economic miracle. The Wirtschaftswende, Adenauer, Erhard, Reuter, and other leaders understood the practical importance of liberty, that just as truth can flourish only when the journalist is given freedom of speech, so prosperity can come about only when the farmer and businessmen enjoy economic freedom. The German leaders the German leaders reduced tariffs, expanded free trade, lowered taxes. From 1950 to 1960 alone, the standard of living in West Germany and Berlin doubled. Where four decades ago there was rubble, today in West Berlin there is the greatest industrial output of any city in Germany. Busy office blocks, fine homes and apartments, proud avenues and the spreading lawns of parkland. Where a city's culture seemed to have been destroyed, today there are two great universities, orchestras and an opera, countless theaters and museums. Where there was want, today there's abundance, food, clothing, automobiles, the wonderful goods of the Kudan. From devastation, from utter ruin, you Berliners have in freedom rebuilt a city that once again ranks as one of the greatest on earth. And the Soviets may have had other plans, but my friends, there were a few things the Soviets didn't count on. <laughs> 
Berliner Herz, Berliner Humor, ja und Berliner Schnauze. In the 1950s, in the 1950s, Khrushchev predicted we will bury you. But in the West today, we see a free world that has achieved a level of prosperity and well-being unprecedented in all of human history. In the communist world, we see failure, technological backwardness, declining standards of health, even themselves, many in a limited way, becoming to understand the importance of freedom. We hear much from Moscow about a new policy of reform and openness. Some political prisoners have been released. Certain foreign news broadcasts are no longer being jammed. Some economic enterprises have been permitted to operate with greater freedom from state control. Are these the beginnings of profound changes in the Soviet state? Or are they token gestures intended to raise false hopes in the West or to strengthen the Soviet system without changing it? We welcome change and openness, for we believe that freedom and security go together, that the advance of human liberty, the advance of human liberty can only strengthen the cause of world peace. There is one sign the Soviets can make that would be unmistakable, that would advance dramatically the cause of freedom and peace. General Secretary Gorbachev, if you seek peace, if you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, if you seek liberalization, come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. Soviets came back to the table. 
creates the possibility not merely of limiting the growth of arms, but of eliminating for the first time an entire class of nuclear weapons from the face of the earth. As I speak, NATO ministers are meeting in Iceland to review the progress of our proposals for eliminating these weapons. At the talks in Geneva, we have also proposed deep cuts in strategic offensive weapons. And the Western allies have likewise made far-reaching proposals to reduce the danger of conventional war and to place a total ban on chemical weapons. While we pursue these arms reductions, I pledge to you that we will maintain the capacity to deter Soviet aggression at any level at which it might occur. And in cooperation with many of our allies, the United States is pursuing the Strategic Defense Initiative, research to base deterrence not on the threat of offensive retaliation, but on defenses that truly defend, on systems, in short, that will not target populations, but shield them. By these means, we seek to increase the safety of Europe and all the world. But we must remember a crucial fact. East and West do not mistrust each other because we are armed. We are armed because we mistrust each other. And our differences are not about weapons, but about liberty. When President Kennedy spoke at the City Hall almost 24 years ago, freedom was encircled. Berlin was under siege. And today, despite all the pressures upon this city, Berlin stands secure in its liberty, and freedom itself is transforming the globe. In the Philippines, in South and Central America, democracy has been given a rebirth. Throughout the Pacific, free markets are working miracle after miracle of economic growth. In the industrialized nations, a technological revolution is taking place, a revolution marked by rapid, dramatic advances in computers and telecommunications. In Europe, only one nation, and those it controls, refuse to join the community of freedom. Yet in this age of redoubled economic growth, of information and innovation, the Soviet Union faces a choice. It must make fundamental changes, or it will become obsolete. Today, thus represents a moment of hope. We in the West stand ready to cooperate with the East to promote true openness, to break down barriers that separate people, to create a safer, freer world. And surely there is no better place than Berlin, the meeting place of East and West, to make a start. Free people of Berlin today as in the past, the United States stands for the strict observance and full implementation of all parts of the Four Power Agreement of 1971. Let us use this occasion, the 750th anniversary of this city, to usher in a new era, to seek a still fuller, richer life for the Berlin of the future. Together, let us maintain and develop the ties between the Federal Republic and the Western sectors of Berlin, which is permitted by the 1971 agreement. And I invite Mr. Gorbachev, let us work to bring the eastern and western parts of the city closer together, so that all the inhabitants of all Berlin can enjoy the benefits that come with life in one of the great cities of the world. still further to all Europe, East and West, 
Let us expand the vital air access to this city, finding ways of making commercial air service to Berlin more convenient, more comfortable, and more economical. We look to the day when West Berlin can become one of the chief aviation hubs in all of Central Europe. With, with, our French, with our French and British partners, the United States is prepared to help bring international meetings to Berlin. It would be only fitting for Berlin to serve as the site of United Nations meetings or world conferences on human rights and arms control, or other issues that call for international cooperation. <laughs> there is no better way to establish hope for the future than to enlighten young minds. And we would be honored to sponsor summer youth exchanges, cultural events, and other programs for young Berliners from the East. Our French and British friends, I'm certain, will do the same. And it's my hope that an authority can be found in East Berlin to sponsor visits from young people of the Western sectors. <laughs> one final proposal, one close to my heart. Sport represents a source of enjoyment and ennoblement. And you may have noted that the Republic of Korea, South Korea, has offered to permit certain events of the 1988 Olympics to take place in the North. International sports competitions of all kinds could take place in both parts of this city. And what better way to demonstrate to the world the openness of this city than to offer in some future year to hold the Olympic Games here in Berlin, East and West. In these four decades, as I have said, you Berliners have built a great city. You've done so in spite of threats, the Soviet attempts to impose the East Mark, the blockade. Today, the city thrives in spite of the challenges implicit in the very presence of this wall. What keeps you here? Certainly, there's a great deal to be said for your fortitude, for your defiant courage, but I believe there's something deeper, something that involves Berlin's whole look and feel and way of life. Not mere sentiment. No one could live long in Berlin without being completely disabused of illusions. Something instead that has seen the difficulties of life in Berlin but chose to accept them, that continues to build this good and proud city in contrast to a surrounding totalitarian presence that refuses to release human energies or aspirations. Something that speaks with a powerful voice of affirmation, that says yes to this city, yes to the future, yes to freedom. In a word, I would submit that what keeps you in Berlin is love. Thank you. 
the city itself, symbols of love, symbols of worship, cannot be suppressed. As I looked out a moment ago from the Reichstag, that embodiment of German unity, I noticed words crudely spray painted upon the wall, perhaps by a young Berliner. Quote, this wall will fall, beliefs become reality. Yes, across Europe this wall will fall, for it cannot withstand faith, it cannot withstand truth. The wall cannot withstand freedom. And I would like, before I close, to say one word. I have read and I have been questioned since I've been here about certain demonstrations against my coming. And I would like to say just one thing, and to those who demonstrate so. I wonder if they have ever asked themselves that if they should have the kind of government they apparently seek, no one would ever be able to do what they're doing again. Sarah and I just if I'm Sarah and all the students, if you ever write a speech and include the line, as I speak, NATO ministers are meeting in Iceland, you will deserve to be fired, <laughs> if not executed. All right, that was the boring part. I don't know if you Questions. Yes, Sarah. That, thank you for asking, that was an ad lib. That was, he ad libbed that on the spot at the moment. It does not come through terribly well in that tape, but off in the distance, there was a protest taking place all the time he was speaking. And so he and the audience could hear chanting in the background throughout his speech. And it ticked him off, actually, as you can see. He was pretty angry about it at the end, but that was, that was an ad lib at the moment on the spot, which one other overall comment, he was 76 years old when he gave that speech. He'd just been in Italy in meetings for six or seven days beforehand. He'd flown to Berlin early that morning. It was an outdoor speech, protesters echoing in the background, a huge crowd, and he was, he was using a paper text. And just, that was a pretty good delivery. He pulled it off, don't you think? One thing to bear in mind about Ronald Reagan is he was really very good. He was really very good. If you watch the way he, when the crowd cheered at the, uh, there was, I, I don't know, Tim cut me off if, uh, I'm wearing Tim's jacket, by the way, so. <laughs> Uh, just reclaim your jacket at any moment. Um, there was a kind of technical problem in writing the speech in that German audience in front of him, American audience at home, problem, two different audiences, but also two different symbols. To the American audience, the important symbol of Berlin was the Berlin Wall. But to the German audience, it was the Brandenburg Gate. 
that Brandenburg 18th century ceremonial entrance to the city. In the old days, only the imperial family was allowed to ride through the central pillars, which is one reason why after Hitler came to power, one of the first things he did was hold a parade in which he and his gigantic open Mercedes drove right through the central arch of the Brandenburg Gate. He was making a statement. But to the Germans, that was <clears throat> the, the 18th century symbol of their city. But very few Americans would even have heard of the Brandenburg Gate. So come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev opened this gate. That's for the German audience tear down this wall, that's for the American audience. And it worked in the sense that when he said, open this gate, there was a long cheer. The Germans understood that immediately. And then if you watch, he let it go, I timed it once, he let it go for quite a while, that cheer. He, all, he knew people enjoyed cheering. Let them do it if they're, if they're inclined to cheer. But at the same time, you've got to control the crowd and move on with the speech or you'll lose the thread. So he did what the, one of his techniques when he had an audience that was cheering, and he wanted to continue, instead of holding up his hands, which would look as though you were almost authoritarian, he would just quietly begin the next line, get halfway into the next line and then drop it. So open this gate, cheers, cheers, cheers. He lets it go for a while. And then he says, Mr. Gorbachev, and the crowd quiets down. They realize he's going to continue. That's technique. He knew what he was doing. He was really good at it. There's a question there too. I'm sorry. Oh. Sorry. Of course, the demonstration, the demonstration was in the West Roman side. Yes. Not the East Roman yes. side. Yes. Not with the communist protest in his appearance, but uh, protesters in West Roman against this conservative president. That's right. The the um, the president later explained. He did, I, I was watching this thing at home. First of all, I didn't know until he delivered it whether he would deliver it or whether the State Department would have smothered the speech. So I watched, the th and I wasn't part of the traveling party, so I was watching this thing in my bachelor apartment in Arlington, Virginia, and I, my first thought was, oh, what a relief. The speech made it through. We got it through. And then my second thought was, wow. It, it so often happened with him. He was so good, you could hear him as you were writing a speech, and in fact, that, that joke about being, well, the well man, all of us speechwriters, the last thing you'd do before handing a speech in was read it out loud or to yourself as Ronald Reagan. So you could hear, you could begin to hear, was this right for him? Okay. But in this speech, as so often, I would hear him as I was writing it, and then he would do, he, he would, he would do even better. He would just do even better. So that tear down this wall, he delivered that as though they were hammer blows. Tear down this wall. And with real feeling, and he explained later that when he got there, this was before the film begins, when he reached the wall, he looked over the observation platform, just as I had, just as tourists did. And he was told that Early in the morning, a crowd of East Berliners had begun to gather to hear him, and the police had dispersed them. And that was what came back to mind when he said, tear down this wall. And so the anger was genuine. He was really angry about that. I mean, you don't, you don't, you don't tell people who gather to hear an old actor to go away. My greatest challenge as a speechwriter overall, I can answer that in three words, hitting my deadlines. <laughs> that's, that's, I often, you know, I wrote hundreds of speeches and there were five or six of us. Ronald Reagan was good at giving speeches, so the White House organization sort of geared itself up to use that capacity. He enjoyed it, he was good at it. It wasn't a terrible, by contrast with George W. Bush, uh, giving a speech was just a huge draw on his time. He had to think it over with the speechwriters. Very kid, meeting after meeting in the Oval Office, and then he would practice a speech, and then he would deliver the speech. George W. Bush found it difficult. For Reagan, giving speech, this was he, he enjoyed it. He was good at it. He'd go over a speech once. He'd have it. Um, 
So when I get asked about this one speech, oh, dude, were you writing some, his, did you know you were writing a historic speech? The answer is no. I had two, the same two problems with this speech that I had with every single speech, and that all of us had. One was to give Ronald Reagan material that was as good as Ronald Reagan. And what I mean by that is, before he became president, he'd established, he'd written, he'd written most of his own speeches himself, and he'd established a voice. You knew what he sounded like. You knew what was Reagan material. And then the second was hitting my deadlines. You just had to get it done. In fact, Reagan himself said when he was in Hollywood in the old days, his first three years in Hollywood, he appeared in 18 pictures. And the president used to say, they didn't want them good, they wanted them by Thursday. <laughs> so it was a job. It's a, so much of life is getting your job done. <clears throat> Thank you very much. You mentioned your group of six speech writers. Was Peggy Noonan one of Peggy was, Peggy was one of the six for two, about two years. She had, she had come and gone by the time of this speech. But the answer is yes. <laughs> Uh, well, this is the one that, uh, <laughs> that's, this, uh, that, uh, that's, well, it's, thank you, thank you very much, well put. I'm trying to think what, oh, there he is, yes, this is, but this was, this was, I was a kid, this is immature. By the way, well, we'll get to come to that in a moment, but um, he had some speech, by the way, if I wrote hundreds of speeches, and other speechwriters wrote hundreds of speeches, a lot of the stuff he did was giving speeches that were just sort of small bore events. And he had to give a speech, I'll give you two. Real, do we have time for, but this will be, one was to some, edge. I don't remember, some education something or other, high school teachers or something. And I had happened to read that it was the 100th anniversary of the publication of Huckleberry Finn. And I thought this was, had nothing to do with politics. It had nothing to do with policy. And this is why I was I, embarrassed to admit it, it was to please myself. I just thought, what would it sound like if Ronald Reagan read Huckleberry Finn? <laughs> so I worked a passage from Huckleberry Finn into the speech. And he did not disappoint me. It was just beautiful. About, Huck and Jim rafting down the river and how the stars came out at night. It was just beautiful. Of course he delivered it beautifully. And then there was a, there was a controversy in the press about Reagan and his 19th century literature and what did he think for education should be more forward. And I just put it in because I wanted to hear him read it. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other one, this will show you, this is how good he was. Really good. He had to give a speech to the Knights of Columbus, and I got the assignment. And I wrote, the, well, that was economic, how the recovery is going. It was a fairly standard speech. And, but there was a problem in the speech I couldn't figure out. And the problem was this. The Knights of Columbus, Catholic lay organization, and it would be heavily ethnic, lots of Italians, uh, some Eastern Europeans, this Catholic population of America, and Irish. Knights of Columbus was going to have a large Irish contingent in the audience. So there was a connection. They're Irish, he's Irish. But there's a problem. They're Catholic, and he's an Orangeman. He's a Protestant Irishman. And I thought, I just can't figure out how to, there's going to be a, They'll feel the connection, but at the same time, these kids a Catholic organization, they'll feel a distance at the same time. And I just didn't know what to do. So I wrote the speech and sent it in. And here's what Ronald Reagan did. He began by saying, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here with the Knights of Columbus. And by the way, I can't help thinking that many of you are, as I am, Irish. And that puts me in mind of a story. And then he told a story about an Irishman who was just off the boat. And he was in Manhattan, and he couldn't figure out how to cross the street. 
didn't know when the traffic was going to start and didn't know when it was going to stop. So a big Irish policeman observes this problem and comes up to him and introduces himself. And Reagan did this Irish brogue. He said, the policeman said, well, where are you from, son? And the Irishman said, well, I'm from County Clare. And the policeman said, well, my people are from County Clare themselves. And then the policeman explains to the Irishman, do you see that light on the corner? When it's, uh, when it's green, the cars go and you stay on the sidewalk. And when it's red, the cars stop and you get to cross the street. It's green, you stay on the sidewalk, it turns orange for a moment, and then it turns red, and that's the time for you to get across. Excuse me, I got it back. When it turns green is the time for you to get across. Okay. He watches it, red, he stays on the sidewalk, turns orange for a moment, green, he has to go. Red, orange for a moment, green, he goes. And he gets halfway across and stops and turns and says to the police officer, Say, officer, you Americans don't give these Protestants much time to get across now then, do you? <laughs> and it was brilliant. They roared with laughter, and from that moment, he had achieved total rapport with the audience. Well, um, in he wants his jacket back, is what it comes to. <laughs> Dedicating this magnificent sculpture, may we dedicate ourselves to hastening the day 
and when all God's children live in a world without walls. That would be the greatest empire of all time. And now let me again speak directly to the young people and the children here and the students here. I wonder yet if you've appreciated how unusual, terribly unusual, this country of ours is. I received a letter just before I left office from a man. I don't know why he chose to write it, but I'm glad that he did. He wrote and said, you can go to live in France, but you can't become a Frenchman. You can go to live in Germany, Italy. You can't become a German or an Italian. And he went through Turkey and Greece and Japan and other countries. But he said anyone from any corner of the world can come to live in the United States and become an American. Some may call it mysticism if they will, but I cannot help but feel that there was some divine plan that placed this continent here between the two great oceans to be found by people from any corner of the earth. People who had an extra ounce of desire for freedom and some extra courage to rise up and lead their families, their relatives, their friends, and their, their nation and come here to eventually make this country. The, the truth of the matter is, if we took this crowd, and if we could go through and ask the heritage, the background of every family represented here, we would probably come up with the names of every country on earth, every corner of the world, and every race here is the one spot on earth where we have the brotherhood of man. And maybe as we continue, as we continue with this proudly, this brotherhood of man made up from people representative of every corner of the earth, maybe one day boundaries, earth all over the earth, will disappear as people cross boundaries and find out that yes, there is a brotherhood of man and this world can become that brotherhood of man in every corner. Thank you all and God bless you. Thank you again for being with us um, and for coming here and joining us at Westminster College and America's National Church and Museum. Uh, I hope you uh, pause and reflect uh, on everything you've heard today. And please come back uh, and visit uh, deep, uh, drink often from this well of, of inspiration. And thank you again, Peter, for being with us. Thank you. Thank you.